Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action. This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Hierarchy Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of hierarchy that govern the operation of God's laws, gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws, and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 22nd of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Well, we're here uh, discussing the four order principles, as Mary has discussed. So this session, the order principles session, very interesting session, actually. I don't know how you found it in your homework, in your reviews of the session before you began, but you'll find that a lot of your questions are quite good, so that's good. And uh, this, this hierarchy principles, which is the first of the four that we would like to discuss with you, is quite another important one to understand. In, in, uh, and my feelings are, obviously, all of them are pretty important to understand, if you really want to understand love in particular. All right, so let's get started. Of course, we have to go back to our terms. Now, remember some of these terms were introduced to you with scope, right? So, so by now you should start you know, start to get used to these terms. We've got creation, the terms of creation, basically talking about anything from the infinitesimally small up to the highest creation, the human soul. Components are creations of less, com less complexity combined in new ways. So we gave some examples in scope of that, remember, where how we got oxygen, an element, and hydrogen, two of them, an element, and we mix them together, they are components for water, H2O. So that's just an ex easy example to remember with regard to how components are used. So any lower creation is potentially a component of some other creation. Now, the human soul is going to be a bit different to that because it's the highest creation. And therefore, the only component that's higher than it is God. There you go. So the human soul only has the capacity to receive component, like to, it can be made of, of lower components, which it is made up of lower components, but it itself cannot be made up, it cannot be used to formulate a new component because it's the highest of all of God's components. That God has building blocks, and the only thing that the human soul is capable of receiving is something from God to, to get a, into a higher condition. Energy, remember the definition of energy? We're talking about information flow, energy flow, emotion, which includes emotions, thoughts, communication, relationships, interplay. Because remember, a lot of the, inter the relationships are actually chemical bonds or electromagnetic bonds or gravitational mass-based bonds and so forth. And these are all form a part of the energetic systems of each creation. And then you've got the properties of the creation itself, which is the properties, the characteristics, the attributes of the creation, internal to the creation itself, that, that then allow this creation to somehow be combined with other creations. And there's laws that govern the properties of that individual creation. So these are all still definitions that we need to remember because they have an influence on how hierarchy is created. So some terms that we need to look at here as well are about complexity. Each creation's complexity is determined by the complexity of its individual components, energy and properties. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? The more complex energetic system it has and the more complex components it has and the more complex uh, properties that it has, obviously it must be a more complex creation. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Now, each creation of higher complexity obviously has higher energy capabilities. Now, you can think of this even at the atomic level if you wanted to. The fact that, uh, for example, water, H2O, combines two elements of hydrogen and one of oxygen, it has to have stronger capabilities than just oxygen by itself or hydrogen by itself. Right? And the same applies, of course, to the human soul being something that mixes billions and billions and billions of components together to make 
a creature obviously has to have extremely highly complex systems and therefore much, much higher energy capabilities, not only inbuilt within itself in its natural condition, but also with regard to how it can receive potentials. Because obviously if, if the human soul can receive potentials from God, that must mean that it has this capacity to grow even beyond that space and actually re start receiving parts of the infinite, which means that it's got to have huge energy capacity. Right? No other of God's creations can receive components from God, parts of God's nature. And that being the case, the human soul must be more powerful than any other thing in the universe. Because all other things don't receive those particular things from God specifically. Obviously, they receive energy from God to be maintained and so forth. But there's specific areas, the most powerful areas of God's nature, other creations cannot receive. Now, if creation has higher complexity and energy capabilities... It's also considered to be higher in hierarchy. Does that make sense? So we now define the hierarchy of creation. So if we go back to our scope uh, definition, shall we do that? You remember we had the, the uh, idea or concept of the hydrogen and the oxygen. Combined in this method, you can say then that this... Uh, this substance which is which is built from these elements obviously must be higher in complexity therefore it is also higher in energy capabilities that and therefore it's considered to be higher in hierarchy in terms of the the gov the the hierarchy principle all right now remember we also suggested that oxygen has a group of laws that govern it and that hydrogen has a group of laws that govern it. And these two laws also mix to create this new structure. So the group of laws that govern the combined structure must be more powerful than the laws that govern the individual structures. Does that make sense? And therefore, this law that governs water, it would be considered to be higher in hierarchy. Now, that's an implied governance system. In other words, it's really saying that water governs hydrogen and oxygen individually. There's an implied governance in it. Now, it's not something that water knows about, and it's not something that hydrogen and oxygen know about, and therefore it's not built by desire, but rather it's built, uh, the implied governance system is built by the fact that there is hierarchy only. Does that make sense to you? So each new creation, so remember we said water gets injected, like with the body, it gets injected into the cardiovascular system of the human, the cell system, let's say, at this stage. And remember we created a whole heap of things over here with scope, which were hydrogen, um, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon and phosphorus all being combined together in specific ways, which forms this... DNA, which is then also in the cell structure. Right. Now, can you see the cell has governance over these things? The cell knows when to let some water in. The cell knows what to do if it combines with another cell or, or splits itself to, in order to create another cell. And, and the cell, therefore, has governance over how the DNA operates. Does that make sense? because of the laws involved. It's an implied governance in that it happens automatically. It's not something um, that the cell goes, oh, I've decided to do this today and tomorrow I've decided to do something else, is it? You see, it's, a, it's something that will happen automatically under specific conditions and circumstances that the law dictates. But it's still a governance system of a kind. Right? That makes sense to everyone? Okay, so the other terms, now let's look at other terms. We've got the inbuilt rules still. So the inbuilt rules in the oxygen atom. There's the inbuilt rules in the hydrogen atom. These inbuilt rules allow for those two elements to combine. Now, there are some elements that can't be easily combined, right? 
because, because the inbuilt rules don't allow those elements to be easily combined. But hydrogen and oxygen are not one of those elements. They combine really easily and they combine at room temperature or in, or in a gas and also in a, in, a, in a gas state to form liquid. And so they, they can easily be combined. So, and they form the new, the new substance, which is the new creation, and the new law which governs the substance are the laws by which water will work. So what determines that at zero degrees water freezes? Well, it's the law that governs water that determines that. What determines that at 100 degrees Celsius water boils? Right? Well, it's the law that governs that, that governs the substance, that determines those properties of the substance itself. So they are the inbuilt rules. And remember the external stimuli of temperature in this case that I've just mentioned. So temperature or, you know, degrees C, obviously has an effect and, and the water has inbuilt properties that say, I'm going to freeze at this and I'm going to boil at that. And the temperature might fluctuate externally through other means like the sun other, and other creation beating on the earth or the sun beating in anywhere in space and, and therefore controlling the temperature of the location where the water exists. And, and as such, it's an external influence on the element. But how that element, how that new substance is, cr is controlled by that external influence is determined by the properties of the substance, therefore by its inbuilt rules. Huh? The external rules obviously means a set of laws and potentials created by creation itself external to it. So temperature in itself is a whole series of things that allow its creation. There are particles, infinitesimally small particles that allow transmission of heat over huge distances of space, right? That are, and, and that then react with atmosphere to create heat. And those, those laws that determine all of those things occurring are also the inbuilt rules of those substances all mixed together, combining to form an effect that is caused by uh, energy in the form of heat. Now you could say that a rule set is just the combination or the interaction of the, inter the external rules with the internal rules of the substance. That's really it is. It's just you could think of it as a law set, a whole series of potentially billions of laws controlling that one thing happening. That makes sense? So you could say law is an individual set of laws or a rule set, an individual rule set. You could call it that, really. It's just another way of naming it, if you like. So when we use the term rule set, whether it's inbuilt rules or external rules, we're just really saying, no, it's a whole series of laws that have been combined in hierarchy to govern that particular substance or creation. Remember, it's a creation. Each of these are creations using building blocks of the lower components in creation. Yep. Okay, so the more complex creation has more complex inbuilt rules, obviously. The more complex inbuilt rules interact with more complex external rules, therefore creating more complex rule sets and laws that interact between these two external rules and internal rules. So there we have uh, the the terminology we're going to use to define, crea to define hierarchy to you. So that's the background. Now let's look at the, the issues. S and we've got to compare scope. You see, this is very much based on scope, isn't it? Scope allows for the combination of creation and a combination of laws, but scope also now's for the, now allows for this hierarchy principle to exist. Without this combination occurring, forming a new substance with, of a higher, with, that has higher, more complex laws and more complex properties, without that occurring, hierarchy couldn't naturally exist. So, so scope allows for the existence of hierarchy. Hierarchy determines the position or place within the universe of each creation and law from God's perspective, how important this law is and how complex it is and how, therefore how much more powerful it is. So we can presume from that that the law of gravity, although a highly complex law in its, in its own state, 
the physical law, must have less properties than the law of aerodynamics. You follow me? But the two do work together, don't they, to allow for flight to occur. So you can see aerodynamics involves gravity, but it also involves other laws in addition to gravity. For example, fluid dynamics and all of those things that are involved in, with how, how gases work and, and so forth. Now, gravity is a component, you could say, of aerodynamics. Does that make sense? In terms of it, the law itself is a component of the aerodynamics law, which is a higher law. Now, interesting thing that if you engage the higher law, in many cases, the, it's like the lower laws don't exist. It's not true to say they don't exist because they are still operating perfectly. But the higher law, you could say, supersedes the oper operation. So, so when water is mixed, H2O is created and it's combined, it'll stay combined unless there are certain there's inbuilt properties that determine its re... Um, what do you call it? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's breakdown into its component parts, right? So there's laws that, that determine its breakdown into its components parts, but if those laws aren't engaged, this substance will stay together even though oxygen has a certain property of its own and even though hydrogen has a certain property of its own this substance will stay together and be permanently staying together until its inbuilt properties are no longer met if you like for staying together and then it, then it will disperse back into its subcomponents and that applies to all creation all creation allows for the dispersal back into its sub components. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at what it does now, hierarchy. So you can see what it's doing is it's determining a hierarchy of law by the complexity of each law. So the complexity of the law that governs water is higher than the complexity of the law that governs oxygen by itself, and so therefore it's considered to be higher in hierarchy to the law that's below it. Does that make sense? Interestingly enough, though, you can't really consider it in a vacuum because oxygen itself has certain principles and properties, and hydrogen itself has pr principles and properties, and also has laws governing it that finished up determining the law that kept this together. Right? So it's really interesting how everything is working together in this way to create function. Right? All the component properties bring, bringing together to create function. You can see the hierarchy of law is an automatic state now. And it determines the hierarchy of creation by the complexity of each creation. So here we see now, on this example here, again, we've got the complexity of oxygen is, and the complexity of hydrogen is less than the complexity of the new substance, which obviously is the mixture of the two. Right? And in the case of our other case with DNA, the underlying building blocks of DNA, which are, which are not very complicated at all, but because of the way in which they're sequenced, builds a very, very complex chain that now can be used, utilised in a higher life form. Right? And even defines the capabilities and the characteristics of the higher life form. So. Th you can see even minor combinations can form highly complex rules and if you chain them together, in the case of DNA, it's a great big long, three billion long or so chain, you can, you can define many highly complex things through that. Very powerful way of determining creation. So it ensures more complex creation is governed by more complex laws. Now that makes sense. If we try to apply the laws of oxygen to water then can you see the the two won't the laws of oxygen obviously wouldn't work for water otherwise water would be returning to a gas all the time right you imagine that you start drinking and all of a sudden it's disappearing while you're drinking it <laughs> like <laughs> that wouldn't be very helpful for your body would it 
Um, so so you, you want it to, to remain in the combined state, and so the higher law must govern it staying and remaining in the combined state until, as I've said, some things are no longer met, some of the inbuilt properties are no longer met. But while those inbuilt properties are met, the bond is very, very strong and will remain until the inbuilt properties are no longer met, then the bond is destroyed and everything reverts back to its sub-components. And that just drills down as far as you can go. So it ensures higher creations and laws exert more power because they now have more combined things in them. That has the, obviously the possibility of exerting more power. Right? Not only uh, at a, in, in, a, in its fluid state, but actually exerting more power if you split, split, it, split it down as well, obviously, because cause it's more than it, it's combined, like its individual combined components. So it obviously has more atomic power as well, uh, as well as the individual power in terms of it in its, in its union, or you could call it in its combined state. It has more energy and, and also more complex properties. Therefore, more things can interact with it, more things can use it, more things can be built on it as well, the more complex it becomes. So you can see that this basically allows for an infinite amount of creation in the amp, which is very, very powerful, and all in hierarchy, all one lower or higher than the other, depending on its properties and its components and the rules that govern it. So it's a very clever little system, isn't it, of, of creating hierarchy. Now, hi hierarchy is very important to create because once hierarchy is created, now we can start making a whole set of other principles based on the fact that hierarchy exists that couldn't be made before. So you could say scope allows hierarchy to be created. Once hierarchy is created, now that allows for further creations of even higher principles, such as the principles of governance, the principles of responsibility, and the principles of compensation. They're all built on these two principles, the, co the commingling, if you like, of these two principles, the, of the scope and the hierarchy principles. So this is a very effective way now of creating a whole heap of more principles that now govern ver from the lowest to the highest of creations and start. And it also allows for the mixing of some principles of very highly complex principles, such as the will-based principles and the desire-based principles that you'll receive in the specific soul-specific section. It allows for these particular principles to have an effect on everything now as well. So we'll talk about how that is at a later time. All right, so now you've asked some questions about these things. So obviously there's quite a few. I think there's about 50 or 60 here, and I'll probably get to answer about 15 or so of them, probably. So I've tried to choose ones that sort of make a bit of, make a bit of logical sense in their sequence. So let's start with Fab on, on this side. And where's Hunter? Where are you, Hunter? You're on this side too. Um, where's... Um, yeah, we'll go from Fab to Hunter, we need to. Thanks, Fab. No worries, is it the first, second? No, it's your number two, thanks, two. Fab. Okay. Can you please explain further what you mean by how more complex individual creations have more powerful energy flow that affect on creations of lower complexity? Yes, yeah, so uh, let's examine this particular thing here, like H2O, water. Can you see that uh, oxygen by itself, if you if you just have oxygen surrounding an atmosphere, or even if you have it flowing, such as the wind, which also has oxygen, but also other gases, obviously, flowing in it, but it can create an, a, an erosive process upon the planet, can't it? But which one has the higher power? Water eroding something, or just the wind eroding something? Can you see that water has a far greater power than wind by itself. 
Now, that's a very rudimentary example. Obviously, wind includes other gases besides oxygen. And in fact, oxygen is a minor component of our, uh, of our atmosphere. But you can see that anything that is in a gaseous, gaseous form is actually got a lower power than water itself, generally, unless the power of the gas is corrosive chemically, it has a lower power. Now, my, uh, we, if we had, we had a corrosive environment, we, we do have partially corrosive environment here on Earth, but if it was ultra-corrosive, our body would just melt away. Obviously, we haven't got that for a good reason. But you can see here that water has a greater power. It has greater amount of energy. That's even as a, as a substance. But if you break it down into its component parts, because it's combining two atomic particles, therefore with far more subatomic particles, it must also have far more atomic power. So if you split it, you tear apart its internal, internal functioning, you could see that it would cause even far more damage than just one atom being torn apart. Does that make sense? So, so it has far more power on a lot of levels, not just on a on a uh, corrosive, you know, a erosion level, which I've given the example of. So would that mean that temperatures are of a higher complexity than H two O, obviously, to affect it energetically? Well, yeah, temperature is an interesting one because it does combine high numbers of laws to create the ability. You know, you need an atmosphere before temperature can be felt. But the reality is there are so many laws that, that govern how temperature can, how heat can be delivered over a vacuum. So, for example, we have our sun, which is the source of our heat, way 93 million miles away. We have here on Earth uh, our atmosphere. But in between here and our sun is a great big expansive vacuum, basically, with no... Uh, hardly any components in it. There, there are all, all obviously substances in it, uh, which many of which you can't see, right? Obviously, for for to allow for the heat generated by the sun to actually reach the Earth and enter it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so obviously, there's uh, uh, this is a very highly complex system, and probably more highly complex than a substance such as water. Does that make sense? So that's why it would affect water. That's why it affects water, has, has control over it. Yeah, energetically. Got energetically, it. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Now, if we go to Hunter next. Do we unknowingly help to create new laws? Yes, we do, Hunter, and um, we'll give some examples of that from other questions. But I wanted to answer your question specifically because we frequently do not realise that our actions, because we don't understand the principles, how our actions unknowingly create things. So, so for example, a, a great example of this is when you hold on to specifically st specific emotions in your soul, your soul, being one of the highest of God's creations, is now getting shut down by your attempts, your desire to shut it down. That unknowingly and unwittingly for most people on earth creates a whole series of diseases in both the spirit and physical body, lower creations. See, the soul is the higher creation, the spiritual and the sp physical bodies are lower creations, and as a result, the, you're, now, you're now creating a relationship between what you choose to do in, as a higher creation and then how that creates things in these lower creations. So, for example, disease was something that God never created. He created systems that automatically uh, clear it out, that automatically get rid of it. But when we unknowingly decided to shut down the emotions of the soul, we unknowingly created a whole new series of things that allow for a disease to exist. Does that make sense? Therefore, we must have created new substances and new laws by shutting down our soul, which we did do. Now, some of these substances existed naturally, but many of them did not and, and do not exist naturally in God's universe. They only exist as a result of the human exercising its desire rather than any other cause. And so this is how many times we unknowingly create a whole series of new things, new creations and new laws that govern them. That, that God allowed for the potential of, but did not himself create.
Mm. Good question. If we can go to Phoebe, where are you, Phoebe? On this side. And then we'll go to Wayne. Uh, Wayne, where, is you? where are you? You're on this side. Yeah. So Phoebe, next. Uh, one or two. <laughs> um, if I could have your number one. Yep. yep. Uh, what makes a law, what makes one law more complex than another? Right. You can see how we've answered that question yeah. really. What makes the law that governs water more complex than the laws that govern oxygen and hydrogen is that these laws are mixing together Therefore, all of their components are mixing together to create the new law. Therefore, this law must be higher of higher complexity automatically through logic. You can see that it must be of higher complexity. And that's how a law of higher complexity is created through the commingling or the joining together of things in the lo of components in the lower complex form. Yeah, thank you. You yep. answered that a lot. Yep. Yep. Wayne, thank you. God allows us to create, then does God create laws that allow GMO foods to exist or are laws created that will destroy some or all of them? Well, it's in, uh, GMO is an interesting question because God did allow uh, humans, th these laws, all the laws, and including the DNA laws associated with all living things have usually some kind of DNA structure. God created, obviously, the ability for us to learn about it and therefore the ability of the human soul to manipulate it in some way. The only problem is that the hu humans are trying to manipulate DNA with regard to GMO substances in such a way that the substance itself cannot reproduce. Now, that is out of harmony with the life principle. Right? So by making a GMO substance that cannot reproduce, you are now creating something that while it may benefit mankind, and many of these substances can benefit mankind, it's not ever going to be in agreement with the way God wants to benefit mankind because it's not able to reproduce, and that's going to cause lots of problems in itself. Does that make sense? Being out of harmony with the life principle. So while God enables us to understand how all of these subcomponents of matter fit together and therefore allows us to develop the skills and the requ requisite knowledge to actually work out how to manipulate them, he would still like us to manipulate them in harmony with all the principles. That makes sense? And when we manipulate them out of harmony with the principles, the subsequent result is going to be some negative effects. So, for example, with GMO foods, one of the negative effects is that now we become dependent on the manufacturer. And to God, from God's perspective, that's a negative effect. Right? If the GMO food had, had a, a, the ability to replicate, therefore to procreate, to transfer its life force from itself to another seed, then that would be better, wouldn't it? And what, far, far more in harmony with God's life principles. So, so yes, uh, it's a good question because God did create the laws that allow us to be able to investigate these things. But if we were wise, which many times, unfortunately, we're not, but if we were, we would choose to do it in harmony with the rest of God's principles. Yeah. Now, obviously... Bearing in mind that hierarchy exists, and as you find later, there's other things that exist because of hierarchy, compensation being one of them. If a profession of some kind develops a substance that breaks some of other of God's principles, there are negative compensatory effects, not only upon themselves, but also upon anybody who uses that particular substance. And this is what happens with farmers. The negative compensatory effect is you become dependent on the manufacturer of that particular product. Now, God doesn't like this whole concept of dependency. He, he, he wants everything to be available to all humans, to benefit all humans, rather than actually benefiting one company above another. So obviously that's out of harmony with some, obviously some of God's love-based principles, as well as out of harmony with the life principle, out of harmony with economy, out of harmony with function, can you see? So we we sure we can we can examine the law that governs how to splice DNA or put little components of DNA from one thing into another thing. We can do that, but we've got to start questioning the advisability if it's going to actually destroy that creation's ability to procreate. 
Now, whenever you destroy something's ability to procreate, you can get to the point where humankind, humans, human life is now in severe danger. So, for example, if the companies that manufactured the GMA, pro GMO products eventually gain so much ascendancy over the manufacture of food on the planet, and then something happened to cause those companies to be destroyed, can you see that a large number of people on Earth would starve to death? Because we can't just grab a seed of our current crop and plant it and it comes up again anymore, you see? So this is where we've got to be so careful. Remember, every time you're breaking one of God's laws, you're adding the possibility that you're actually destroying your own life in some way or potentially destroying your own life in some way. And this is the big danger with GMO type of products. Does that make sense? So while they have, some, have the life principle built in them, and also if we think about it, the economy and function principle would dictate that, that we would not, we would not uh, copyright it or intellectual property it. We would allow it to be given to anybody, all and sundry. We would have more of a value of the whole human race, not just our own financial welfare, right? If we did that, then that would be more in harmony with God's principles and therefore have a benefit to humanity. So God's not saying you can't play around with the DNA of things because he's given us the ability to do so. But he is saying that if you do it out of harmony with all of my principles, you've got to expect some negative results. Right? That's really what he's saying. It's a good question, though. Um, so, Paige, could I have uh, Paige? And who did I have after Wayne? Was there anybody? No, Paige. Next. And after Paige, could we go to uh, Claudia? Where are you? There. And uh, Denise, can we go to you on there? Thanks. So. Thanks, Paige. Could you clarify the objective to create implied instinctual or automatic governance, responsibility and cons compensatory systems which are not based on will or desire, but rather upon hierarchy, and why has God not included will and desire? Well, if God built hierarchy based upon will and desire, then only the human would be involved in the hierarchical system because the human is the only creation of God that has will and desire. So you can see that hierarchy had to be created outside of the concept of will and desire so, so that it could be inbuilt into creations that don't have will or desire. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it yeah. does. And in fact, if God only did it with the, the human the human soul, it means the human soul would be the only thing that has any structure and order, but everything else is a mess. <laughs> Does that make sense? And, and of course, God's lower creations are just as structured and ordered as all of God's, uh, God's very highest creation, actually. So that's why God did it this way, uh, so that he could, can, he, he could actually include this implied hierarchy and governmental si governance space system upon all matter, not just upon the creature that he created that had will and desire. Mm. Good question, though. Thank you. Okay. So let's now go to Claudia. You were next. Um, my question was very much the same. It was, what do you mean by implied governance? Uh, no, it's not that's that. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, that's the one. That's the one. Yep. You did right. Yep. No, that's good. Yeah. So the reason why I've come to you is because you, uh, can everybody, I just want to drill home this point about implied governance versus actual governance. What I'm saying here is that actual governance, when we come to that in the next principle after lunch, what you'll find is we're going to be talking about it specifically in re relation to the human soul. In other words, we're going to be specifically addressing the issue that the human soul has will and desire and, and how governance allows the human to govern other things in creation. Implied governance allows other matter of higher complexity to govern the constituent components of that matter without being dispersed back into the individual components, without, in fact, being destroyed. Otherwise, you'd have the forming of matter and then the instant reforming of the, or the, infinite, the instant destruction of that matter back to its original components. So we need a way, God needed a way to keep the new component together 
And the way that new component is kept together is by the fact that the law, the higher law, implies governance over the lower laws. And that's how the component stays together. Right? So your body is made up of billions and billions and billions of components, right? You imagine if they all started to go back to their <laughs> original created condition. You know, you, you'd sort of start forming and then disappear, you know, because everything would be going back to its original created condition. If God didn't have a hierarchy of law governing the fact that there's a law, there's got to be a law governing your body that says, let's keep all the water in there and let's keep all the oxygen in there and let's keep all the cell based DNA structure in there and let's, something has to be keeping it all together. Otherwise, if, it, and, and you know, as soon as you die, as soon as you no longer have the power of the energy system in this body, all of the subsequent components of this body starts going back to its, to its original created condition, the, com the subcomponents that automatically happen. So there has to be a way to keep it every, all of it together. Right? And these are the higher laws that govern these particular things. And it's interesting with the physical body because life, the life principle in the body, is, has, is a very highly complex system of laws and as such it has almost complete governance not, not complete because the soul does but in your physical body life, the life principle existing in your body gives complete governance over the way that your body functions while you're alive but the instant the life principle, the life force leaves you the body it's left the body, the soul is no longer able to maintain a connection to the body and as a result, the life force principle has left the body. What happens then? Automatically starts from that moment, decomposing back to its original properties. Does that make sense? So that's an example how implied governance would work. Now, now, if you didn't have a soul, you'd have a spirit body still and it would be the spirit body that would supply that life force until the physical body's limitations are exceeded, right? And as soon as the physical body's limitations are exceeded, there'll be a snapping of the energy system that, that controls the spirit body versus the physical body. And as a result, the physical body will be without the life force. As soon as it's without the life force, which is one of the highest governing things of any created creature, instantly the thing starts decomposing back to its original, original subcomponent state. Yeah clever system, hey? so that, that all those subcomponents can then be reused somewhere else. So your body gets reused <laughs> when you're done with it, <laughs> which is a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah, seven yeah, billion bodies on the planet. Imagine they're all just laying here on the ground and <laughs> every new person that dies, there's another person laying on the ground It can't get reused, can't get used by anything. Imagine that. It would be like in the end you have, you know, there might have been, the, you know, there's a, the, at the moment there's the they feel that there's been about 20 billion people that's ever lived on the planet. You imagine 20 billion bodies piled up <laughs> in rubbish dumps because they can't decompose and back to their original components. What a mess we would be in, wouldn't we? If this if it didn't happen with regard to our waste even, our waste would all just stay together and wouldn't decompose back to its original components. What, what, how terrible would that be? You know, it, it, it allows these systems to reform life, which is part of that life principle, remember? So that's what it allows for. Okay, Denise. If you do one and two, we'll do one first. Thanks. Okay. In regards to the spheres and those in them, is it true to say that they are governed by principles and laws greater than those in the lower spheres? Um, yes, the each sphere is a higher creation than the previous sphere and so therefore each sphere of a higher number obviously has higher principles, uh, well it's not it's the same principles but has higher laws that govern the sphere and, and the created components that exist in those spheres are higher in, than the, the spheres of a lower nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this applies to universal systems as well as individual components. So it applies to universes, what you would consider to be universes even. There are a hierarchy of universes. Each, each universe of a higher hierarchy contains and dominates the universes of the lower hierarchy. And it's, and it's natural, part of this law, all working with regard to universal structure. Yeah? So, yeah? 
Question two. So following on from question one, so those in higher spheres have greater scope than those in lower spheres, but those in lower spheres have the potential to develop and this displays God's great love for all? Yeah. You're dead right. That's exactly what is happening. In the lower spheres, the people in the lower spheres are obviously not engaging the higher laws yet, and so they remain governed by the lower spheres group of laws. But a person who's in a higher sphere can actually govern and is actually given govern, uh, governance over the persons in the lower spheres. Of course, the higher the sphere is, the more love you have and therefore the, uh, the more loving the governance that you have over the lower spheres. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why the, the higher spirits can communicate with us on a lower level yeah. and actually assist our development. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So... And they have actually the power, even though they don't exercise this power, but they actually have the power to kill you. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Good to know. But you see, by the time you get to the second sphere, but, which is the time, you know, by the time you get to the second or the third sphere, you've got enough power to kill somebody on Earth, but you've also got more love than anybody, and you wouldn't do it. You see, power is only given naturally through this process to those things that are in a higher condition of love, which is a very interesting thing. So, so it means, yes, uh, like our celestial spirit friends could kill you in an instant. No? But they don't, because they couldn't have even got to their current condition if they had a desire to. Interesting, isn't it? So that's interesting how God works with regard to even human governance over other humans now can we go to nikki on this side um just it's your question two nikki and sheridan where are you at the back there yep uh, we'll go to you next and karen prompt where are you on this side if we have a mic at karen and then we'll go to sherry okay so thanks nick does the hierarchy principle allow for the workings of let's say the law of repentance to supersede the correction-based workings of the law of compensation, meaning a different condition is now experienced by that human soul. Yes, so it's hierarchy that actually determines the fact that the law of repentance is a higher law. It involves many more laws than the law of compensation does, and it involves the highest of God, both laws involve the highest of God's creation, obviously. But, but, but the law of repentance involves many more parts of, of those laws. And as a result of that, and, and you'll see later that actually it, it, the law of repentance it revolves around desire, whereas the law of compensation revolves around will. So, so, so law, will based, w laws that are based around will will have a lower effect than laws that are based around desire. They have a higher effect. And this is something that many of you need to learn uh, uh, when we get to there because, because you can see then the power of your desire in comparison to the power of your current condition, which is your will. Now, now God's created it that way so that you can, with your desire, do many things that with your will you could not do. And in fact, if, if God didn't create it that way, you would have no capacity to either devolve or evolve, actually. So, because it's your desire that determines your devol devolution, and it's also your desire that determines your evolution. You follow? Yeah. So, so, so the law of desire controls, or the principles of desire control, the power of your soul and, and what your soul is capable of achieving in the future. And, uh, and your will basically controls what it does right now, what you do right now unless you exercise desire, right? But those two things are very important. We're going to spend a lot of time about on those, obviously, because they're very important to understand from a human perspective. They're one of the most important things we need to understand. And, uh, but, but you can see that hierarchy gives also the ability for God to create principles that have hierarchy. So remember we said in a, in a previous discussion with you that the there were the foundation principles, right? And then there's the order-based principles that sort of built on the foundation. You could say then that the order principles 
are higher in hierarchy than the foundation principles because they involve more of the foundation principles. Right? It's a joining together of the principles. So, so this is why hierarchy principles actually also allow for uh, principles to exist that have hierarchy. Right? Yeah. As well as laws, as well as creation. Yeah. Which is very, very interesting. Of course, remembering that the highest uh, of all of these principles obviously are uh, love, which are part of the foundation principles. So we're not suggesting that order principles are higher in hi hierarchy than love here. I'm just saying that order principles are a coagulation, if you like, a combination of all of these principles mixed together that allow for their creation. So, so order could not exist without love, right? And order cannot exist without truth, but it also cannot exist without scope. So, so order combines all of these principles into, into in, and allowing for highly complex creations to exist as a result and highly complex laws to exist as a result. Cool. Yeah? Cheers, Good. bro. Sherry, uh, sorry, we're going to Karen next, if I just... Karen, both of your questions, one and two, Karen, would be good. And then we'll go to Sherry on this side, so... Yep. When you say any lower creation is a potential component for a higher creation, does that also imply that in the future the human soul could be merged or transferred into something greater, but still within God? Well, of course it does imply that, but, but there's only one circumstance under which it can happen. So, so what Karen's asking is, since all of the, every creation is a component, then surely the human soul is a component. Well, that, that is true to a degree, but the human soul is the highest of God's creations. So in what way can it become higher? Only by connecting with the highest thing in the universe, which is God. That's the only way it can come higher. And that is, in fact, what the transformation principles are really all about, receiving a part of God's nature, the highest being in the universe, into the human soul, which is the highest creation of the highest being in the universe. And so this allows for the human soul to be transformed uh, by receiving some of God's characteristics and nature. Yeah. But God could have made it where we couldn't do that. You know, he could have made it where he decided it's a gift if you think about it isn't it that he gave, he gave us the ability to receive a part of himself he could have made it so that we were still the highest creation but we don't have the gift don't have the ability to receive something of him he could have made it that way if he wanted to but he didn't because he loves us and wants us to share in his nature yeah so that's really lovely too yep. next question is an example that the two spirit halves merge to produce soul union? Um, this is sort of a misunderstanding uh, in your question, I feel, Karen. The spirit halves don't merge to produce a soul union. The soul is already unified. It's just not, it's just not aware of its state of unification, remember. And the spirit halves are two smaller or component creations yeah. of the soul. In other words, the soul... Is not it, it can exist without these bodies. If it, so, unlike these kind of creations here, the soul is like a, a separate creation of its own that's got all these different subcomponents, and it just connects to bodies in the universe in order to express itself while it's one half. And so, we've got to see that actually the highest creation in this physical universe where you can see is just the physical body. The highest creation in the metaphysical universe is the spirit body. They're the highest creations. The soul controls those highest creations, right? Because it is a higher creation again. And it's, not, it's, ne it's never considered from God's perspective to be two halves. It is one whole, right? It's only our perception, our our imaginary state of separation that has caused us to see it as two halves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, if we go to Sherry, thank you. Um, are laws that are higher in complexity and therefore higher in the hierarchy more based on will? Um, for example, the law of forgiveness and repentance compared to the law of compensation, which automatically acts on our soul? 
Yes, uh, some, uh, some little problems with the way you formed your question you can start seeing there. Mm. The law of compensation is a law that acts upon the will, remembering that yes. our will is our current condition. Yeah. Right? Desire is the thing that the law of repentance and forgiveness acts upon. Desire mm. is actually a higher thing from God's perspective than will yep. and able to con control your will, in fact. Mm. And as a result of that, the law of repentance and forgiveness operates upon that higher law again. So, so the law of compensation, while it's a very high law at operating upon the, the soul itself, it is a lower law still than the law of repentance and forgiveness, mm. which is all more based around divine laws of love. Yeah. And, and the law of repentance and forgiveness is triggered by desire, yeah. not by your current condition. Yeah. So, so you can be in the hells Mm. and have a desire for repentance mm. or you could be in the sixth sphere and have a desire for repentance yeah right and and as long as the desire is there and it's pure and in harmony with all of god's other principles mm. all of uh, principles of love and truth it can be engaged and therefore receive forgiveness from god as a as a transmitted force as a as an energy part of god's love being received into the soul yep. now the reality is, though, the laws are obviously the laws that operate upon desire are more highly complex mm. than the laws that operate upon will. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that. Yeah. And and so therefore, desire must be a very high mm. condition mm. of the human soul, mm. governing governing what it's capable of doing not only now but also in the future yeah so that means sort of desire is higher than will in some way or, yeah. well it's a part yeah we in the first in the first uh, group we presented it as a part of will remember we called it aspiration yes and we also talked about it as faith yep remember yep. but desire is actually faith mm -hmm. and it is a higher it's a higher thing than current condition and this means that you could actually get healed from a current condition by having faith in a new condition. Yes. Uh, we'll talk about practical ways that that can occur, obviously. Mm -hmm. But once you understand that, you can also see that if you had faith in God and you really had strong faith in God, mm. potentially you could cure every condition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yep. you. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, work my way through what I've behind here. Okay, we've done that one too, that's good. Uh, David Raisman, and Ludie's not here, so I'll read out hers. Um, so where's David? Where are you? I'm here. So just put up your hand there, matey. Um, both of your questions, 12, uh, both of your questions, yeah. Okay. How do hierarchy principles prevent the complete destruction of any form of matter? Well, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, oxygen... It is combined from subatomic particles and they are combined from other particles even smaller again and, and it drills down quite quite deep into the and in, it, particles that we've not even discovered yet right but, but but what hierarchy principles do is they say if the life force that combines these two things or these this th that is found within this creation that combines all of these substances to form this creation is no longer able to be sustained, it will automatically break down into other components, right? And it will only go down to the next component that can, can be sustained by the life principle in that component. It will only break down to that far, that far. It won't break down all the way back down to the subatomic particle level Right? It will just break down as far as it needs to break down. Now, the beauty of that is that it means that these things can form the building blocks of other matter. But it also means that when something gets destroyed, it doesn't all of a sudden go back to its infinitesimally small particles every single time, because it doesn't need to. Right? Because the, hi the, the hierarchy that governs this still is able to be maintained. So... So if the hierarchy, like t if temperature is in, in injected into this and they are extremely high temperatures injected into this, let's say, then water can no longer be sustained. It for forms the gases that make it 
and eventually becomes not only vapour but the gases that made it, which are hydrogen and oxygen. If the, and that's only if the, chemi the elemental bond, the chemical atomic bond between the two substances are broken. If the atomic bond gets broken, then oxygen goes back to being itself. But, but the power to break the atomic bond here is higher than the power to break this atomic sorry is the power to break this bond is actually lower than the power to break this bond so to so to break that down into its particles is much more difficult you're right yeah and that that means then that this particular pr property or this particular substance can remain and be utilized in other things and and the reason why that is the case is the energy requirements of maintaining this bond are going to be lower than the energy requirements of maintaining this bond. Because remember, this has higher energy. It, it also has higher energy requirement in, order, in the law itself that governs it, whereas this one has a lower energy requirement in the law that governs it. It no longer needs as much um, energy to keep the bond together. And so it actually works out quite interesting um, and remember, we're talking about these principles in terms of the formation of, of matter, but, but we're not talking about these terms in terms of some scientific principles regarding things like what is the strength of bonds. Because actually, the lowest forms of matter have the highest strength of bonds. Is that what stops the destruction? Yeah. Yeah, the lowest forms of matter have the largest strength of bonds in terms of the components that keep them together. So, so it's almost like the more infinitesimally small the s particle, the higher the bond is that keeps that particle together. Uh, mm -hmm. The higher power it has. Yep. So hierarchy we're talking about here in terms of creations that are, that are really above the, sub, the atomic level. Yep. Make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 13, maybe? How does a higher law have an effect on a law of lower complexity? Does it directly impact or morph the law somehow or supersede it? Yeah, so basically it supersedes it. So you can see that as long as the, this, the law that governs this remains in effect, then this cannot be dispersed back to its original components. So, so basically, the law that governs this supersedes these laws. You can't, you, you can't, uh, supersede's probably not the right word, actually. Um, in fact, I don't know if I can find an English word that actually would, would actually properly describe it. Because, because it's not as if the lower laws don't exist still. They still, they still exist. They still function. So, so the lower law doesn't, doesn't, it still exists and it still functions. If we give an example of that, the lower law of gravity still exists even though the law of aerodynamics is being used, right? Gravity still exists. So it's not like all of a sudden, you know, you, you, do, you, get, you engage the law of aerodynamics and gravity no longer exists. It's not like that at all. But, it's, but in some ways, it's like it doesn't exist in the sense that in the sense that you can now utilize the higher law and overcome the limitations of the lower law. And it's the same here. The lower law still exists, but this is now overcoming its limitations by this third law. Over There's one law here, two law, a second law there, and the third law, which is the higher law, overcomes the limitation of these things by themselves. And so it's like the laws that govern those no longer exist, but they still do. And if you disperse this back to its component particles, they'll still be there. Just like if you no longer have wings on a plane, gravity is still there, right? But, it, but while you have the wings on a plane and you're providing thrust, it's providing lift and therefore, um, and you've got an atmosphere, of course, you need to have an atmosphere, um, you'll get lift and therefore you can fly. But, but the gravity is still there. The lower law is still there. Now, if we look at the laws regarding the soul, it's exactly the same. The lower law is still there. So, for example, the law of compensation is still there, still operating. But when you engage the higher law, the law of repentance and forgiveness, it's like the lower law no longer exists, but it still exists. You're just engaging a whole heap of different 
you could say, different cons considerations, different, you're engaging a whole heap of different um, components that now mean that that lower law is subservient to this new higher law. The higher law will dictate what's happen, what happens, right? And it's the same with every one of the laws. The higher law will always dictate what happens until it can no longer maintain itself through the properties of the creation no longer being able to maintain its internal properties. And then all of a sudden it disperses back to its lower components automatically and therefore to the lower laws that govern those components. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. No? So, so you can see that um, the way God's created it means that this means that all the higher laws have a huge amount of power, but the power is really dependent upon all the little individual bits of power <laughs> of all the lower laws operating certain ways to create the combination of things that create that higher law that then give it its power. Uh, and because, as I've mentioned earlier, with the soul, the will is different to the desire, and desire is more powerful from God's perspective than will, and God created the principles based on that, then that also then means that um, any law based on desire is going to be more powerful than any law based on will. Yeah. The same applies at the atomic level and, and the, the physical level, the body's levels, all of the... So, so, for example, at the moment, the law governing your digestive system has more power while the life force is provided to your body than the law governing the destruction of subatomic particles. Otherwise, all the subatomic particles will, will, will all just automatically disperse and you wouldn't exist and you wouldn't have a digestive system anymore. Does that make sense? So the, the higher law has to be governing these lower laws in some way and therefore have hierarchy over them. But it doesn't mean there's a, like the limit, these lower laws are limited in power because there's immense power in them. And in fact, if you think about them, they're almost like the building blocks of power, aren't they? Like each low component, the lower the component, the more it's going to be used in other components. Isn't that true? So, so the lower the component, the more highly likely it's going to be utilised everywhere. Yeah. And therefore, in some ways, it has quite a lot of power, doesn't it? But, but just individual power of the component itself is very small in comparison to what it's making up. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah, thanks. Hierarchy, eh? Hey? <laughs> okay. Now, Lydia's question why is, was, why is it important for more complex laws and creations to have more power than less complex laws and creations. Which leads me to what I was just talking about. The reason why it's more important that this has more power, this law, is that if it didn't have more power than this law, then, then this mixture couldn't occur. It would have to then go back to its original created condition, uh, whatever that created condition was. Now, bearing in mind that the original created condition could be just the infinitesimally small particle we haven't even measured yet, that would mean everything goes back to that, which would be a terrible disaster, wouldn't it? You'd have no creation then. You'd just have the particle existing and nothing else. This allows for more complex creations to, com to be created and then to be maintained. If the higher creation did not have a law that had a higher power than the lower laws of its components, then the higher creation could not exist. Can everyone see that? Yeah. And, and if the higher creation doesn't exist, that means, and, and you've got this infinitesimally small pro particle that nobody's measured yet that actually is the, is the building block of creation, then everything would, as soon as you created it, it would instantly decompose back to the building block again. So you'd have no way of maintaining any creation. Right? And therefore, you know, even in a practical sense, you know, it's like you build a car, the next day it's gone. <laughs> you have to do it again. It wouldn't even be the next day, though. It would be the next instant. So you couldn't even build it because everything you're trying to put together would be instantly back to its original lowest common denominator, which would be the infinitesimally small particle. 
So God had to create a system that allowed for higher laws to have more power of governance over, and therefore higher in hierarchy, over lower laws so that the creation itself, the higher creation, can maintain its own existence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Alan, you'd like to ask? So that's part of the principle of permanence. Yes, yes. If, if God hadn't injected the principle of permanence into this creation or he had done hierarchy in a different way, you can see there'd be no, nothing that would be permanent. Not a single thing would be permanent, perhaps except for the smallest particle. That would be the only thing that's permanent. Now, that would be, as you can imagine, a bit of a disaster for any other form of life or any other creation. So obviously there had to be this principle that gets injected into it which allows for higher laws to dominate lower laws under certain conditions. Of course, the conditions must be met. Right? If the conditions are not met, then the lower law naturally takes precedence. Does that make sense? So the higher law condition has to be met. So in the case of temperature for, for H2A, a certain condition has to be met. Otherwise, these, these two elements will go back to their original out, not uncombined state. You know, if the conditions are met, then it will always be H2O, if the conditions are met. Right? And this is the, the law, the inbuilt properties of the, of, the, of the new creation determine the conditions. Right. And then the external environment determines the effect that the external environment has upon the conditions. So, so all of us have in the body, for example, the physical body, you, there are conditions that you must meet right, for life with, the, with this body. You can't go into a thing that's too hot. You can't go into a thing that's too cold. There's conditions that must be met. But while those conditions are met, the law governing the body itself as a complete unit will retain every single billions and billions and billions of structures inside the body will keep them all together. But as soon as the condition isn't met of temperature differential, that won't happen anymore. Make sense? And then it will start decomposing back to its lower and lower and lower components depending on what conditions need to be met. So for example, once the life force has gone out of the body, the life force in the cell now can't be maintained. So all the cells are going to decompose. Can you see that eventually things will go back to whatever the lowest component is that can be met under the condition and then it will stay there, ready for it to be used again as that component. Yep. Awesome, eh? Yeah. So, Rebecca, you'd like to? This will be our last question, guys. Um, is it possible to discover what elemental parts God's love is made up of so we can learn more about God? Well, any elemental parts that are a part of God are very, very difficult for the human to actually discover because they are all parts of a being that's greater than the human soul itself is and and therefore all parts of a being that is like all parts would be very very difficult for us to actually discover what forms them does that make sense to you yeah. Yeah, and and this is a inter so it's an interesting question it's sort of like asking like who made god that's an interesting question but at the end of the day um, all we can do is suppose logically that nobody did, given that God's infinite. Right? So, but if we can't understand who made God, we also can't understand many of the other questions associated with who made God, which include what particles is God made up of? Does that make sense to you? That can't be answered either. Yeah. And there's, there's quite a lot of questions about God when you think about it that you probably, from a scientific point of view, are going to struggle to answer until you've received enough substances from God to actually start to feel or know what those substances may be. So I feel, I feel given an infinite uh, life, 
we, we're going to find it very, very difficult to actually discover m much in that, in, in, you know, in a billion years' time, we won't have discovered much about God. In your 2,000 years, have you had any inklings towards? Well, I know what God feels, because mm. God shares those feelings with me, but the feelings that I get from God, I don't understand the particles that are involved and the mathematics that are involved in those specific feelings. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because I because we and we don't have the capacity, no one has the capacity at this stage to know those things. Um now in let's say let's say in a like fifty billion years time, whenever that you know, whatever we've done in that time, which you can imagine might be quite a lot, <laughs> we might have found out, oh, we've now discovered that God's love is this mathematical formula. We might discover that. But I think it's going to be a long time coming because it's a part of God. It's not a part of God's creations. Understanding God's creations for the highest soul, for the highest creation, the human soul, is quite easy given that every other creation is below you. But understanding a creation that is above you is next to impossible unless that creation shares the knowledge with you. Now, our capacity to understand the knowledge that may be shared is even limited. And so even to have God share knowledge with us, we have to allow God to give us part of God's actual being, God's substance, mm. before God would be able to share that knowledge with us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And so you end up in many theoretical questions now that are very, very difficult to answer. Of course, they're the study of many um, celestial spirits now. This is where, what celestial spirits discuss a lot about. But at the end of the day, there's nobody actually at the moment who does know what the mathematical formula is for God's emotion of love, for example. Does that make sense? And, and in fact, I sort of feel like it's highly unlikely we'll find out in the next billions of years, let alone thousands of years. Makes sense? Given the fact that, that God is a higher creator, is obviously the creator, and therefore of a higher nature than we are ourselves. Um, the only way we're ever going to know is by receiving as much of that nature as possible to know. Yeah. So any question about God is always going to be, aside from God's feelings, any question about God is always going to be, from a mathematical or scientific perspective, very difficult to answer. Any question about God's feelings is going to be very easy to answer because God transmits those feelings to you. God also transmits the mass, but understanding the mass requires the development, right? Understanding a feeling is much easier, right, than understanding the mass involved with the feeling. Yeah. Make sense? Thank you. Yep. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the hierarchy principle. Hopefully you've gathered some uh, information from that that's, if, that's good. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do after the break, and if we can come back at um, 25 2, if that's okay, 25 to, uh, 2, and um, after the break, we'll be looking at the governance principle, which is related to this principle. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I'd just like to make a comment about the previous discussion, which, uh, Igor, if you can just make sure we edit it onto the previous discussion, the one about hierarchy principles. Um, and that is that uh, I think for many of you, there's a bit of a misunderstanding about power versus forced, force um, with regard to interactions in matter. Um, the higher the law, hierarchy principle basically says the higher the law, the more complex it is. Since the higher law is more complex, it has more things that can break it and therefore break it down to its sub, you know, its sub components. And and as a result of that, while that higher, as long as the, as long as the higher laws requirements are met, 
it will maintain the function of that higher creation. But as soon as the higher law's requirements are not met, then the creation starts breaking down to its subcomponents. Right? Now, since the subcomponents are less complex, have less complex laws, it's harder to break down a subcomponent into further subcomponents because there's less conditions under which that less complex law uh, can be broken. Does that make sense? And that's something to consider with regard to hierarchy and scope. So from a scientific perspective, the very smallest components are the hardest to break because there are less complex laws that govern them and since the laws are less complex, the forces required to break the component are much greater. Does that make sense to you? And this is why with subatomic particles, for example, they have to shoot them at high velocities with huge amounts of power and so forth just in order to start getting them to interact because, because there are much simple, more simple laws governing them and as a result of that, the bonds by, from those simple laws are much greater. There are less there are less conditions under which those bonds can be broken. So I just wanted to say that to you from a scientific perspective, you'll be able to see how that works, uh, but it's still a part of that hierarchy principle which we were discussing.